I have a feeling what you guys are going to get a lot of questions about our moose, because that seems to be what people come to Jackson to see moose and elk, uh, and all the tiny, cloudy critters. Um, and so I'll touch on kind of what we're seeing disease-wise in moose that you guys can kind of help illustrate to your to your clients as you're out and about. Um, we'll touch a little bit on CWD, and then I'll I'll just open it up and answer as many questions as I as I can, or until you guys are tired of listening to me talk. Um, so this is one that we've been arterial worm, also known as Eliophora, um, is a is a parasite that we've been working with for probably the last 20, 25 years. Um, it's it's the ailments are caused by a, a parasitic nematode. Uh, they affect blood supply to the face and extremities, mostly the eyes, ears, nose, brain. Um, at high densities, at high iliophora loads, they can cause uh, blindness and potentially decreased neurologic function. It's kind of hard to measure neurologic function in an ungulate, um, but they seem to, at higher, higher prevalences of this, they seem to kind of function less right, if that's a term. Um, and high parasite loads, we do believe, can potentially lead to death. We, we picked up animals that have 50, 60, 70 of these little boogers in them. And that's what we're talking about, are these mm -hmm. things, these, these worms. This is, uh, I, I also have the, the privilege of having like all the dory slides and I, I don't get to take very many nice pictures. They're all like this. Um, this is the carotid artery right here. And that's what we're talking about when we say these are these are causing reduced blood supply to the face. Right here is what it's called a bifurcation. Uh, this is where that carotid artery splits uh, right at the base of the neck. And so as you can see, these nematodes don't, don't negotiate that, that bifurcation very well. They build up there. That's just plugging up the blood supply. So it's cutting off the blood supply to the, to the face, the eyes, the, the ears. Uh, you can see on this moose, tips of the ears are gone. These these are these are animals that you know evolved in very very cold climates, boreal climates, where they're dealing with you know, heavy winter snow loads, uh, really really cold temperatures. They're they're built to handle the cold, and when you're losing bits of your extremities, something's going on. You're not getting that blood supply. Things aren't functioning right. And this is the, the culprit. This is what spreads that nematode. It's a, a fly, it's a horse fly in the traumatic family. I guess that's all that we're talking about here. Um, yeah, we've, we've noticed uh, what's called clear eye blindness. So the eye itself is functionally okay. Uh, but what will happen is the optic nerve is one of the major uh, organs that are that are impacted by these this kind of this lack of blood supply caused by iliophora and so it actually kills off the optic nerve so i functionally is perfectly fine um, but it's just not working because the optic nerve is, has died off um, and so that's one where you can see you'll see moose running around with cropped ears um, that's that's one of the telltale signs the majority of the time if we do necropsy one of those moose we do find Eliophora in it. Um, hair loss syndrome or or winter ticks is another one that, uh, especially this time of year, you'll see quite a bit. Um, the the actual syndrome is is caused by the the, paras the the tick parasite causing irritation on the skin, and that moose um, trying to rub to itch to relieve itself uh, of that kind of nagging biting. Uh, when they rub, they're not very good. Moose aren't very good groomers. They're not social groomers. Um, they've got big, goofy heads and short necks, and um, so they're not very nimble. They don't, they don't groom well. And because of that, they rub, and that's how they kind of try and get those ticks off of them. And when they're doing that, they're actually breaking the guard hair. So the guard hair is kind of the idea of you know the, the big, thick insulation that you have, it traps a bunch of uh, air against the skin, which actually is a great uh, source of, of warmth. Uh, think of like a big down coat. Um, when they break those guard hairs off, 
you can see the inside of the guard hair, which is gray, which is why you start seeing these moose. They look like that. <laughs> that's a that's moose that broke off all the guard hairs, and it's just what they're seeing is just the inside of those guard hairs. Um, when they break those off, you lose your ability to thermoregulate, and it results in an increase in metabolic rates in the winter. And what we're seeing potentially this, this last year is because of that and because of some climactic variables that are, that are kind of occurring more often in, in the valley, uh, we're seeing reduced body condition and, and potentially death due to high, uh, incredibly high densities of, of ticks. We're talking thousands to tens of thousands of ticks on, on a single individual. Um, they're just, they're crawling in them. Uh, but I feel like of the moose we captured this last year, will be 100%, they all have winter ticks. And, and high tick loads. Um, this is something that we didn't really notice a lot 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, we're seeing a lot more of it now. We're seeing a lot higher rates and prevalences within this moose population, which may kind of tie into why we're seeing pretty good calf production, but we're not seeing a growth in the population. Is it may you may just not. They might not be surviving long enough to really um, benefit from that high cat productivity that we're seeing. It's, it's my understanding that climate change is playing into this a little bit. Can Potentially, yeah, yeah. So we, um, another researcher in the valley, um, Amy Williams or Amy Gerard, uh, was actually trying to key in on that. So the thought process was: Are we seeing more ticks because there's more ticks? Are we seeing uh, more ticks because there's they're, they're not, and her work was a lot more tied to Eliophora, but same kind of idea where are we having more productivity of these, these parasites? Her work looked at whether or not we were having multiple generations of traumatic flies uh, that were throughout the summer. So are we just producing more flies which spread more nematodes to more animals? Um, what we're potentially seeing with, with the hair loss and the tick, winter tick syndrome is the environments those ticks are falling off on in the spring are more conducive for the ticks to survive. So if a tick falls on snow and, and it's fluffy snow, it has a fairly good chance of, of dying. If it's like icy rind snow, like hard packed snow, they have a, a higher chance of survival. And if they fall on dry ground, they have a, a very good chance of survival. So, the fact that our springs are becoming more truncated and shortening when those those ticks are being cast off of the, or when they're casting off the, of the moose are they falling on the, a substrate that's going to be conducive for survival or are they falling on something that they can't make it go up and more often than not we're getting into that that kind of casting period and we're fairly snow free in the valley um, so yeah i think that's a, a Climactic variable that's really playing into this. So yeah, these are this is a picture of a, a moose high tick load, and you can see, I mean, these dark spots, those are all ticks that are on it. And it just rubs and rubs and rubs and breaks that off. And uh, they can also become anemic because they're pulling a lot of blood. Um, so they're they're working hard to produce enough blood to stay alive. Can they die just from the blood loss? Potentially, we see that in other parts of the, the country. We see that, we believe we're seeing that in parts of the Northeast where they have just such high tick loads and they have very, very high calf mortality that they're actually capturing a lot of calves in the winter just to kind of monitor them as they go through into the spring. And, and they've actually documented calves that have died of anemia. So much more of a calf issue, but we're seeing it in adults as well. And we're seeing pretty high mortality. We're, we're having a hard time tying the mortality to a smoking gun. We're finding a lot of dead moose, we're sampling a lot of dead moose, but we're not, there's no conclusive, this is what's driving this. It's a lot of things, and I think they're all kind of additive at this point. Do you find locally that they are, you're finding higher tick ones in certain parts of the valley or certain parts of that was kind of our thought process. Uh, when we first started the project with Troy and Allie and Gary, the idea was maybe if we're able to document like 
oh, the river bottom moose, the new Wilson, and Peel's garbage. Those are the ones that are like, you know, once you start looking for it, it's at a higher prevalence than, than we often think. Is the department seeing reduced hunter interest? We do, to a, to an extent. Um, we can't, we can't, we can't explicitly say that we're seeing reduced interest because of increased CWD. What we do see is, uh, and, and most people are hunting because they're after, you know, prime age male animal. And what CWD is also taking out of the population are prime age, predominantly male animals. So, especially in Southeast Wyoming, we're just not seeing that older age class mule deer survive. Um, and so we classify deer as class one, class two, class three. Class three is like 24 inch outside spread plus. Um, their class three population down here is two, three percent of the population, where the Wyoming range, it's like 30, 40 percent of the population. So because that opportunity is not there, the hunter partici participation is also dropped off. Uh, it's also hard to convince hunters to, to continually harvest animals when, especially down in this part of the state, every third animal you harvest or every other animal you harvest is CWD positive. Um, so yeah, we're looking at 40, 40, 50% prevalence in some of these deer herds. Uh, we're seeing elk herds that are 10 to 15% prevalence. Um, in herds where we try to keep the population younger through increased harvest, we're seeing much lower rates of CWD. That's kind of the, and it's interesting to talk about the Black Hills, high deer densities. We also have very, very high hunter density up there. Um, and we have not seen this track with anywhere else in the state. Um, and you can see it's, Pretty pretty diffuse up here anyway, but it's been here since 2005. And if you look kind of everywhere else that CWD spread, this hasn't changed a whole lot as far as CWD density and prevalence. So there may be something to having that kind of high hunter participation, high hunter harvest, and keeping that population younger because there's still a lot of deer in the Black Hills. We're still having, you know, we're still issuing thousands of of uh, fawn tags to try to curb population growth. Um, but we're also not seeing that kind of CWD prevalence spike like we're seeing in other parts of the state. Um, yeah, this is this is the projects. Very low hunter participation, a lot of private land, pretty low deer densities, but the deer that are being harvested are coming out positive. I think that's all the slides I made. Right. I'm more than happy to ask, answer any questions you guys have about this or whatever questions you want to talk about. Yeah, hit up Dan. Yeah. Have a question. Yeah. Um, with the uh, increase in the population of Wyoming, Your herds that are that maybe have a little bit more cattle, you know, that they're they're sharing the land with uh, with you know domestic cattle. Are you seeing those areas have a little bit more CWD presence in elk? Are also the cattle having a higher presence of CWD in them? So um, chronic racing disease is a disease of, of serpents. So it's um, it's a prion disease. Uh, much like crystal yaka disease in humans or, or BSC, mad cow disease and, and livestock. So we haven't seen CWD jump from wildlife to livestock, which is good because uh, if that was the case, uh, wildlife would definitely play a heavy, heavy price for that. Um, what we do typically see is areas, uh, it seems that CWD kind of runs in Agrarian areas or areas where animals are more sedentary and not as uh, migratory, potentially because they're spending more time 
in and amongst the prions in the environment. So we don't see high densities of, of CWD in like Western Wyoming yet. We also have deer that are using a lot of space seasonally. So they're, they're migrating from the, the grow bonds all the way down to the grass springs, where there's deer in you know, Sheridan County, Johnson County, Fremont County, that their entire lifespan is spent probably in two city blocks. So they're just kind of always in and amongst it, where, um, you know, especially as CWD has kind of moved across the state, there's kind of a, a latent period where it kind of becomes established and then it takes a while for it to kind of accumulate in the population and accumulate in the environment. And during that time span, if those deer are moving more and kind of not spending a ton of time just living in it, it seems that that prevalence stays lower um, in areas where those deer are more resident and just camping in on, you know, the, the face of the mountain in Sheridan where there's thousands and thousands and thousands of whitetails living in agricultural areas, we're seeing 30, 40 percent prevalence in some of those populations. So no, we haven't seen jump over to livestock. Uh, there could be a correlation. You, you could draw a correlation between agriculture and CWD, but it'd be more or less because of uh, agricultural practices, uh, growing crops, providing that habitat to hold more animals in that area is probably why we're seeing higher prevalences of, of CWD there. Uh, so I'm from the Northeast, and along with Clinton Tech, uh, like where you White tailed deer out here, but I didn't know if there was any reported cases of brain worms. We have not found an angel worm in Wyoming. We're, we're looking for it. That's something we definitely look for, but yeah, it's northeast is hammered by an angel <laughs> worm and winter ticks. And yeah, they're, they're kind of they're hitting different segments of the population, but they're hitting them pretty hard. And so I guided for a few years in, in that North Park. North Park region in Colorado, mm -hmm. and occasionally we would see a moose out in the field just running in circles, and I've been told that's some kind of, is, was that that nematode, or is that the meningeal worm? That's that's probably you, the opera. So yeah, it's probably that, that arterial worm. Yeah, we, it, was, it was interesting. When I first started with the department, we picked up a lot more of those. Um, mm -hmm. Moose just walking in circles, just kind of disoriented. Don't see nearly as much of it now. Maybe it's the ticks are killing it before the, uh, the, the arterial worm can get to them. I, I'm not sure what. The, I'm not sure why we're not seeing more of that now. But that's probably exactly what you were seeing. Is that moose was just walking, just clear eyed blindness, just walking in circles. Um, moose and, and their decline in parasites and such. You're showing in terms of long most of my trips. And when we have conversations about it, what, what would you do if you were in charge of moose population? A lot of people bring up let's dose all the moose in Jackson Hole with some sort of tick medication that you give to a dog. Can you give your response to that so I can then? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <That's my guess. laughs> so this, this is a question we get asked a lot. Yeah. And there's a lot of research going on in the Northeast on this now, and, and ways of kind of managing habitats to allow for the treatment of moose. Um, kind of hard. What we, what we typically tell the public is, it's one thing if like, you only dealing with a handful of moose and they're in a confined area, and you're going to have you're going to see them day in day out. Uh, we deal on kind of a population basis, so we're we're dealing with 350 moose that we've seen, probably many more moose that we don't see, and we're not really treating the issue. We're just treating the symptom of the issue. We're not we're not really moving the ball forward on, on kind of moose conservation if we're spending all of our time driving around trying to dose sick kind of parasitized moose with ivermectin. Um, we don't have the manpower nor the ability to do that. Um, it's, it's sad, it's kind of a tough question to answer. It's like there's things that we potentially could do but that's not a it's not a wide scale thing. It's not a, a population scale um, kind of alternative that we can use. Um, and then yeah, you can overdose animals. 
these animals are also being not so much the, the female portion of the population, but the male portion of the population um, is at times uh, available for harvest. And so we're using an off, off lane. Potentially the best thing that we can do for moose is to not. There, there are many places that we just can't have moose because of what the climate's doing, what parasites are doing, what development's doing. Um, it's also sad to think that if the only reason that moose are able to survive in Teton County is because we are heavy handed going out and capturing, covering them in ivermectin, kicking them loose. Um, yeah, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with kind of the model that we use for water management in the state of Wyoming. Uh, long, long, long winded answer, but. Oh, no, yeah. <coughs> That's one of the things I, I mentioned when I'm talking about it. It's hard because we get, yeah, people. It's very like, you could go out and treat that moose yeah. in your backyard that was awful, but, you know, then scale it up to like hundreds of moose in a wild scenario. You know, yeah, it's just not people. So, considering, I'm from Ohio, so we don't have those moose or elk, but considering you guys have a elk refuge. Be any talk or anything of creating a moose refuge? We used to feed moose in the state of Wyoming. We used to feed everything in Wyoming. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a different time. It was a different age. But um, yeah, we used to have, especially kind of in the well up north, uh, they used to feed them up at Triangle X. Um, they used to food, feed moose up in the Buffalo Valley. They used to feed moose all along the the Wyoming Range and the Wind River Front, um, more as a way of keeping them out of the haystacks. Um, they were causing a lot of damage. Um, that's one of the main reasons we feed elk is because of damage, commingling, compensation to landowners for damage. Um, we've gotten away from feeding the majority of stuff. We feed elk in Western Wyoming, we feed substantial proportion of the population of bison in western Wyoming. And that's it. We don't feed moose anymore. We don't feed mule deer. We don't feed antelope. Um, so we, we work and we're actively trying to kind of curtail feeding where we can or to reduce the dependency of animals. On it's like my thought was like not only just the feeding aspect, but if you had at least like better habitat or a refuge for them, it could hinder them from the car collisions or better understand the pesticide diseases? I yeah, I think we'd see density dependent diseases okay. explode. Okay. Um, I think we, at, at some point, we will have CWD fairly well established in all of Wyoming. And pulling moose together on a feed ground with CWD kind of in a mix is a bad, bad thing. And, and I'll just touch on the like 10,000 pound gorilla in the corner. Um, we do feed elk in Western Wyoming. We feed lots and lots of elk in Western Wyoming. We try to use the best knowledge we have available to do it in the best way possible. Um, we're currently going through a process as an agency, um, a stakeholder driven process to develop a feed ground management plan for the next 20 to 50 years. So we're actively working with the public to, to, to come up with ways that we can manage feed grounds to address disease currents, disease concerns that are coming up and damage concerns and highway mortality concerns and distribution concerns and population concerns and we're trying to work through all that to create a doc a management document that we can begin utilizing to better manage feed grounds um, so yeah we I don't know, I feel like we talk about this a lot, and oftentimes we, we talk about diseases, we talk about density-dependent diseases, but then we kind of leave that off the table. That, yeah, we do feed a lot of animals, and we're actively trying to do the best job we can at that. Um, the director of the Game of Fish had said, if we knew what we were getting into 100 years ago, we would have gone a different direction, but we're now in this, and we've got to work with what we have and the sideboards that we have to work with it to try to do it as best as we can. Yeah, they can. That's the really cool thing about the, the project that we're, we're working with the grad student on is we're actually able to see these moose over multiple years. And so, yeah, we, we've had moose that look absolutely horrendous. Um, 
they could see they produce far or they produce young. Um, we had a moose last year that looked like she was on death's doorstep the entire winter, and she had two two calves and they survived. And I think they're still surviving. Or, um, so yeah, they, they can come back from it. It's I like to think of it as kind of a, a cycle, and the longer so as long as you stay at the upper level of the cycle and you're you know, you're not losing a ton of weight over the winter, and you're putting on good weight and you're producing calves, you're good. But as soon as you start to kind of drop off, it takes a lot to get back up to that same plane. And I'm afraid that maybe what we see is these moose that have heavy, heavy parasite, parasite loads maybe aren't gonna come out of the winter in as good a condition. So they've got to they've got to try to make that up. It's hard to make that up when you have calf or have a calf on your heel. Uh, you're trying to raise a calf. And so we've seen, through some nutritional work that's been done, we've actually seen um, what are called reproductive positives. So cow moves will have a calf, and she's not in good enough body condition to carry the, the, the calf the following year full term, or the calf's born weak, or something happens. And so she's more or less having a calf every other year. And in a healthy moose population, we're expecting them to produce twins. In a healthy growing population, we, we look to, to, to conceive and produce twins. Whether or not they both survive, that's that's kind of up to chance, but um, moose naturally, naturally twin. And so having that like, and what I guess I'm getting at is that, that kind of nutritional deficit that they get pushed into because of, you know, climatic factors, parasites, the, the cost of just raising the calf can push those down to, you know, their productivity drop 75% if they're having a calf in the year. So they, they do survive, they will bounce back. We don't know what, what that does to them in the long term. Is there a relation between like habitat quality and parasite load in moose populations? Potentially. Troy's looking at that. Uh, Troy's our, our graduate student that's working on this. Um, it seems that there's some vertical, vertical horizontal cover components that tie into that. Because what these these ticks fall off in the spring, they lay their egg sacs. Those egg sacs hatch in the late summer, early fall. And so if, if you have, if everything is ground level, say you drop in a hay field, you drop the ticks in a hay field, well that, that's not gonna produce the, the horizontal structure that you need, horizontal and vertical structure you need to actually be able to quest and, and get onto another host. Um, so that's part of what they're working on, like the Northeast is these fairly, um, regular burn cycles where they're burning that underbrush off uh, as a way of kind of reducing tick densities because you remove that substrate they need to to survive to to produce eggs and then to uh, actually get back on the host so Troy, Troy will dig into that more but yeah I think there'll probably be a factor of, of kind of nutrition kind of nutritional capacity of the areas that they're in um, I would think you would see much higher densities of ticks in, say, the river bottom than you would in, like, a logical pine forest, where there's not a whole lot of understory for those animals to kind of survive, and there's not a, a big death layer. Do you know how late in the fall the ticks are finding their hosts still? Ooh. Yeah, long, basically, there, like Ben said, the term is questing, where basically they climb up on the vegetation and just kind of wait for something to come by that they can grab onto. And I think what Troy has found is that He's doing tick, tick sampling and drags in the fall. And, um, he's found ticks basically until the, there's enough snow to like push that, like to push the grass down or kind of push the vegetation down. Um, otherwise, like so here, November like this one means more ticks. So right. like Ben yeah. said, yeah, these longer, warm falls mm -hmm. allows the ticks a longer time period to try to latch on the animal. Yeah. So kind of if it snows early, kind of that can shut that. Do they infect other animals besides ungulates? I'm sure they do. Um, you know, we're we're basically looking at moose and elk and deer. It's kind of what we're keyed in on because those are kind of the normal hosts. But I'm sure they 
get on wolves. I'm sure they get on S small ones on wolves. Sometimes it's very rare to find an actual adult to come. Up with and I kind of wonder if it's it's tied to like the social structure of the wolf pack. It could be. Or I some mean, social grooming. Yeah, my experience is probably more host selective than yep. than you might think. Yeah. But I do know that like for tasty Lyme disease and like the viral stuff, their first life has to be through like a reptile or an amphibian. So they'll get under those two. And then the second life is when they give it to you on That's a different species. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah different species. Go ahead. So I I met Allie this fall and brought her in here to have like every disease known to man, except for CWD. Um, yeah, you did have her um, Like really gross. Uh, and I just did like, I have a lot of burning questions from that. But we were, when we were in the field with the deer, one thing I noticed, we were not the deer, I you know, rode for a living. So I've never seen literally thousands of ticks on a deer. Thousands. I mean, just like its skin was moving, and I just, I've been wondering. I was like, man, that's a lot of deer. I've seen a tick here and there, but not like that. So I wonder, it's like same tick, different tick. Like, I, I don't know anything about ticks. Just wonder, is that like common? Common? It's uh, pretty uncommon in the fall to see that density of ticks. Probably, probably just a sick one. Sick one. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know. That's that's pretty fascinating. And with. Um, with that as well, I mean, the main probably had, and I could be wrong, I don't know which type of tapeworm it was, but they were they were tapeworm uh, larva in the, the muscle um, of the animal. And when I later took it home to dissect it and just see if anything was salvageable, I don't think I could go more than a half an inch within a muscular section without finding um, a larval tapeworm. And uh, I wondered, like, as a segue to wolves, like, you know, with, with more canines, taking in, we'll see that every watching those types of pathogens become more present, less present, like within the population here. Well, that's your hotels. <laughs> <laughs> when you're talking, when you bring wolves into it, you're talking about 